Well, good morning. Don't you like that song? You like that song, just kind of mellow in. We come out of worship and then we go into this kind of mellow tune. Anyways, good morning. We're so glad you're here. Thank you to the worship team for leading us in worship this morning and the entire team that uh, worked so hard to bring you Sunday celebration services. Come on, let's give it up for them. And of course, thank you for everyone all week long that worked so hard to be the hands and feet of Christ as all nations serves in life groups and outreaches in the community. We're just so grateful to be working with you. And I thank you for our amazing, amazing team. Let's give it up for them one more time. All right. Yeah. My name's Pastor Rick, for those that don't know me, and it's a privilege to be part of the team uh, for Sunday mornings and uh, for the church, All Nations Church. We've been working hard getting the new facility ready, so we're excited. By the grace of God, we'll move in before Christmas, so keep praying, and uh, we'll be moving in, and it's going to be absolutely beautiful. We look forward to a place that we can uh, use as a tool to um, reach people, to love people, and to serve people. Um, I don't know if you were here three or four weeks ago and we did, all the life group leaders got up front in theater too. They got up front and uh, they described the, their life groups that they were doing. And my wife, Kathy, scared the life of me, out, out of me up there. She got up there and she starts talking about a group that she's doing. And uh, the book is by John Eldridge and it's called um, Resilience. And the illustration that the author uses in the beginning of the book is that of a camel. Now, how many people have ever seen a live camel? Yeah, live camels are quite amazing. They're beasts of burden. They're, they're uh, like, you know, great big caravans. They're used in India and Egypt and Africa, all over the world because these animals are very unique. They can carry a very strong, you know, a heavy load and they can go a very, very long distance, like thousands of miles, literally, uh, without stopping or without getting something to drink. And they just, just keep moving, keep moving and keep moving. But there's one thing about a camel. Uh, they tell me that the camel just keeps moving and moving, and then all of a sudden, he doesn't show any symptoms or sign that he's getting weak, but all of a sudden, he kind of stops, grunts a little bit, and kneels down his front two legs, and he falls over dead. And yeah, that's what camels do. And uh, it kind of scared me because Kathy's been telling me a lot, you know, you need to slow down a little bit. You need to relax. You're doing a lot of things, and it has been a busy season as, uh, as uh, is this okay, Josh? It has been a busy season as, um, you know, the new church and lots of exciting things happening up north. And uh, so, you know, the margins are a little stretched a little bit. So, um, you know, you're just, you're working hard, but I feel good because God is doing so many amazing things. There's great things happening. And, and sometimes when great things are happening, you may be running on empty, but you're so full by looking at the goodness of God that you just keep chugging. Or you may be here this morning and you're, you're running on empty and you know you're running on empty. It's like, I cannot go another day. But often there are symptoms underlying your life that if you stop and pay attention, you'll recognize that even though you're full and God's doing great things, there's warning signs. And it's really important to learn how to take a look at that so that you don't drop dead like a camel. I don't know if you've ever been like that. Some of the warning signs some people experience. Maybe you've just got a little bit of a bitterness under, under your breath every day. You're just kind of something going on. You're just kind of grumbling all the time. You don't know what it is. You don't know what's bugging you, but you're just kind of bitter. You're, you're you know, groaning a little bit. And, you know, maybe, you, maybe you're feeling like a little sad. You've been overlooked or are you feeling like you've been set aside? Or maybe, maybe you're like me and you're just afraid you're like that camel. You're just going to die one day and just keel over. And we are going to look today at our series. It takes two. We're going back into the life of Israel as they enter into the promised land. And we're going to take a look at some of the things they did to ensure that they made it to the promised land. And they walked in good success, not just success. Because you can walk in success and all of a sudden keel over but you can walk in good success. And that good success is that you live a long life and you are blessed and walk in God's blessing and your children will walk in God's blessing and also inherit the goodness that God has provided for you. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about, you know, how to keep blessed versus burned out, how to keep thriving and not just surviving. And I titled this message, Possess Your Promise, but I, I think we should really just call it, Don't Be a Camel. Be a camel. Don't be a camel. All right. Let's stop and pray and ask God's grace on this message today. 
Father, we just so need you. We, uh, I invite you to come and move by your spirit here today. I thank you that you've been moving among the worship. You've been touching hearts and lives. Father God, I pray that you would uh, take my words and, and uh, let they be your words. And they would touch people's hearts. They would encourage people. They would strengthen people. I thank you that your Holy Spirit would show us anything in our life that maybe is an indicator that things aren't well. And Father, I know that as we commit this time to you and we invite Jesus to move, that you will come and you will heal. You'll come, you'll deliver. You'll come and you'll set free. You'll come and you'll encourage those that are discouraged today. Father, we invite you to come and do this and we ask it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, wasn't that baptism awesome? <clears throat> Kids out there snowing. Man, one of our first baptisms in... Uh, when we first launched the church, sure enough, it was 11 below zero and the wind was blowing. People out there baptized and guys are standing up singing songs spontaneously. It was so, so beautiful. I loved it. Well, um, the portions of scripture that we're looking at today are thir Joshua 13 to 19. And this is the distribution of the lands to the children of Israel. So they'd, they'd crossed over the Jordan, they'd entered into the promised land, and they'd fought all these different fights and won all these different battles. And now it was time to divvy up the goods. It was time to divvy up the goods. So um, some of them got what was great. They actually cast lots and that determined what portion of the land, the promised land they got. But Caleb was different. Caleb got exactly what he wanted. He described and declared what he got. He didn't just take what was given to him that was casually handed out. He got what he wanted. And I tell you, there's something more for us as, as, the, as kids of the Lord. There's something, you know, we sometimes just take what casually comes to us, but God is saying, there's a place you can be with God. There's a place you can be walking with God that you can say, Father, I want this. And it's not for your own selfishness, as we'll see. It's for the purposes of advancing his kingdom. But there's more. Say, there's more. There's more. And I believe God has got a message for us today to challenge us that there's more. And God wants to help us see that. So we're going to look at Caleb's personal conquest to inherit his promise and also trans, uh, pass it on to his children. So the backstory, first uh, first time we meet Caleb, he was encamped at uh, Kadesh Barnea. It was uh, near the Negev Desert. It was at, out near Mount Sinai. It was about two years after they, they left uh, Egypt. And there they were. And what had happened, Israel had seen lots of signs and wonders. They passed through the, the Red Sea and they saw the, the majority of the Egyptian army destroyed. They'd seen water from a rock. God supernaturally provided for them as Moses struck the rock and water flowed out. They were fed every day by manna from heaven. They'd seen lots of miracles. And then uh, they fought the Amalekite raiders who came in and, you know, tried to beat them up, but these guys went from slaves that were just building pyramids and building Egyptian structures to warriors. God supernaturally turned them into warriors. They hadn't warred for 400 years. They'd never seen war, but in this wilderness, in this time of trial and struggle, they actually became mighty warriors by the hand of God. Uh, Moses had received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai twice. He uh, came down, he destroyed the golden calf, which the Israelites quickly after seeing all those miracles, they still went out and built themselves something else that they could worship by themselves. And uh, they built the tabernacle and they constructed the Ark of the Covenant. So what was happening was all things were coming together and they were becoming a solid nation. They had received the covenant from God and they had decided they were a nation and, and God was going to be their king. They didn't have a natural man king. They had a God uh, king, right? So here it is time to enter into the promised land. So at the time, Caleb was about 40 years old, and he was a recognized leader as the tribe of the tribe of Judah. And so it was the biggest tribe, and he was the leader. And here we are going to retell this story from him. We're picking the story up in Joshua 14, 6 to 14. And this is, this is Caleb talking about that situation. A delegation from the tribe of Judah led by Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, came to Joshua at Gilgal. Caleb said to Joshua, remember what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, about you and me when we were at Kadesh Barnea? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan. I returned and gave an honest report, but my brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. 
So that day, Moses solemnly promised me, the land of Canaan on which you were just walking will be your grant of land and that of your descendants forever because you wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. Now, as you can see, the Lord has kept me alive and well as he promised for all these 45 years since Moses made the promise, even while Israel wandered in the wilderness. Today, I am 85 years old. I am strong as strong now as I was when Moses sent me on the journey, and I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. Some of the men in the place should be saying amen about now. So give me the hill country that the, that the Lord promised me. You will remember that as scouts, uh, we found the descendants of Anak living there in great walled towns. But if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land, just as the Lord said." So Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephthunah, and gave Hebron to him as his portion of land. Hebron still, belonging, still belongs to the descendants of Cable, uh, Caleb, son of Jephthunah the Kenizzite, because he wholeheartedly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, this is a really, really interesting story. And what I want you to pick up on, he didn't just get what he wanted. He actually got something for himself. And by God's grace, he learned to transmit it to his descendants that they still possess the promise today. And um, we recognize that, um, you know, we can learn some lessons and I'm going to spend the rest of the day just talking about some lessons that we, we see from this passage of scripture and we see from Caleb. Number one, um, he learned how to walk in fullness without running on empty. And that's what we want to pick up on today. How can we make sure that we are full, but we don't run out of, of steam? Even when you're walking with a low, bunch of low-minded thinkers in the desert, you know, a bunch of people that were grumbling and complaining, and, and he continued to walk with his head up and his eyes up, believe in God for the very best. And he did that for 45 years. I don't know about you, but I'd have said, forget it, boys. I'd grab Kathy and a couple of friends and say, we're going in, we're taking this land. I forget these guys. You know, but he didn't. He stayed faithful to the people of God, faithful to the call of God. And 45 years later, he inherited some. So here's some of the lessons we can learn from him. Number one, he had a wholehearted commitment. He said three or four times in there, he found uh, an excellent spirit was found in him because he had a wholehearted commitment to God. God honors those that uh, follow him wholeheartedly. Remember in Joshua 1.8, God was saying, this is what you got to do to possess the land and live in good success. He said, this book of the law will not depart from your mouth. In other words, you're going to keep the book of the law in front of you. You're going to learn it. You're going to live by it. And you'll meditate and think about it day and night. Then you'll be prosperous and then you'll have good success. Do you realize that some of the children of Israel went in the promised land and they did not have good success? They had this inheritance. They had this big feast table poured out in front of them, but they did, their life didn't end well. Caleb ended well because he had a wholehearted commitment to God. We need to recognize that it's not just the circumstances around us we're looking at. We're not seeing, comparing ourselves to our peers. We each have a responsibility to follow after God wholeheartedly. Okay, we have a responsibility. Your pastor doesn't have a responsibility. Your parent, your husband or your wife doesn't have the responsibility. Each of us has a responsibility to follow the Lord wholeheartedly. And that's what Caleb did. Okay, so what does wholehearted look, uh, wholeheartedness look like to you? Well, unwavering faithfulness. I don't know what's going on here. Um, we see back at Mount Sinai, Israel agreed to the blessings and the curses. So God said, here's the conditions. If you obey these uh, you know, commands of God, you'll receive these blessings. It was very clear. And I know obedience is not a word that we like in our culture very much because we're so individualistic. We so live our life according to our timing when we want it. You know, I found Kathy's learned how to walk, you know, Amazon and order online pretty good the last two years. And of course, I've learned how to, you know, skip the dishes, but we want things instantly. And man, now there's Amazon Prime. You know, it's like, I don't want to wait four days for it. I want it tomorrow, right? And I don't know about you, but that's what we want. But we have a responsibility, each and every one of us, to obey the word of God. And obedience brings blessing. Do never forget that. Okay, you're not going to get a blessing because you go to a church that's blessed. You're not going to get a blessing because this. You're going to get a blessing because you have a relationship with God. You take that relationship serious. You listen to him and you respond to what he says to do. Even when it's not popular in culture, even when it's not, um, you know, pleasing 
sometimes to your, uh, those around you. You have to obey the word of God and with that comes blessing. Okay, walking wholeheartedly means you're generous, not selfish. Okay, is there an area in your life that you need to be more generous? We talked about this Christmas program coming up and what an opportunity to just share with people and just give freely to people. What, a, what an opportunity that is. But some of the children of Israel were, were, they wanted the instant gratification right now. They weren't generous. They weren't sharing what they had, whether it's their time, their talent, their treasures. They were living for themselves, even in the midst of this blessing of God. They were selfish. And James 3, 14 to 16 says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and evil practice. We need to recognize if we lean into being selfish, our life is going to unravel and there may be something going on under us that's going to cause us to not do well or run into trouble later in life. Second Corinthians 9, 6 to 8 said, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Okay, Proverbs eleven twenty four. one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. God wants us to be generous and not selfish. That's one way to live wholeheartedly. Um, forgiving and not holding bitterness, bitterness in our hearts. Many people, scripture says, we'll all be offended sometime in our life. We were offended by this situation, that situation. And can everybody agree with me? You've been offended before? Yeah, we've all been offended and, and it's going to happen. But what we do with that offense is the, the thing that's going to cause us to get beyond it and live well. And we need to forgive. We need to learn to forgive those that have offended us. And scripture says in Ephesians 4.32, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Jesus said in, in Luke 6, 37, do not judge others and you will not be judged. Don't condemn others or it will come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Man, if you've been offended today, if you're holding a bit of a grudge against somebody, it's not hurting them, it's hurting you. Ask God for the grace to forgive this morning and surrender and release that thing. Sometimes this bubbling bitterness or resentment running around, you know, we don't know what it is, you know. Um, it's actually this unforgiveness and we just need to say, Lord, help me release that, release that, release that. You know, it's exciting right now. People say, people are excited about... Um, you know, COVID is over and, you know, we're, we're getting back to a normal life. How many people are happy we're getting back to a normal life? Yeah, we're getting back to a normal life. But thinking of the camel, psychologists are telling us that we're really not back to normal yet. That there is a, there's an undermining um, something. And although we're excited and though life is going good, there's still this under um, innate kind of anxiety and in, 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 in a, this fear and uh, trouble. And, and you see it bubble up in, in resentfulness and some of these bitterness that we see. So it's important to forgive. Okay. Another thing to be wholehearted, humble confidence, not fear of rejection. Caleb and Joshua, they came back 45 years ago and they reported that we can well take this land. Yeah, there's giants here, but it's a good land and God said we could take it. God said he would empower us. God said he would drive people out. And they rejected them. The whole nation rejected them. Imagine if you got a word from God, you're moving forward and everybody else says, no, that's, that's not right. We're going to get beat up. Don't do that. Imagine you'd like, you wouldn't want to speak up again, would you? You know, if you're rejected by the whole, your whole family and your whole um, group or your whole, you know, whatever, I, I thank God. But uh, one time when I was uh, first came to the Lord, when I was 20, I could not stop talking about Jesus. I'm just talking every time my family comes for business. I'm just yakking, yakking, yakking about Jesus. And one time, one of the person in my family said, can you just stop talking about Jesus? Like you're driving us nuts. And I don't think we can come here anymore if you don't stop talking about Jesus. And I said, well, I will try, I'll try. But, you know, Jesus said that I should talk about him a lot. You know, I just carried on. But you know what? You're going to experience rejection from people, not necessarily over the gospel, but over something at work, over a decision you've made. You're going to experience rejection and you've got to learn to get through that and know that insecurity comes from that, but God is going to help you get through that. You're going to have humble confidence, not fear. Joshua 1.9, our, our 
core scripture for this series. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God is with us. We don't have to fear rejection. We don't have to fear, walk around insecure. God himself is with us and we need to move forward confidently. Tim, Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but power and love and self-discipline. That's what we have. That's our inheritance. That's what we have to humbly, confidently walk into. Okay, well, what's another thing we see in the life of uh, Caleb that's important? Well, I titled this point, Compromise Brings Demise. Compromise Brings Demise. There are two and a half tribes who decided to stay on the east side of the Jordan River. So they said, Moses, hey, this place looks good. There's lots of green grass here. It'd be great for our cattle. Do you mind if we just stay over here? And they said, yeah, okay, you can stay over there. And God is really good to us. He, there's his perfect will and his permissive will. And uh, God is a God of love and he gives us free will. And, and God is not going to force you to do something. He's going to say, here it is. Here's what my plan is for you. And you decide, well, it's, I, you know, I'm close to the promised land. Can I just stay in this side? It looks much more better. These guys, much more better. There's my good English. Um, it's much more better over here with the cows chewing their cud. But they just decided, yeah, they, they made a, a decision based on finances. They made a decision based on this is going to be better for me. It's, it's wealthy. You know, it's going to be more, more wealthy. Uh, I'm going to be more wealthy because I'm going to have fatter calves and cattle. And so God will let us do something. But you got to know when God gives you a command to do something, um, he's already considered everything. He's considered what's best for you. And he says, do this. But he's going to be good. He's going to, if you resist the Holy Spirit, if you say, okay, I'm not going to do what he said, I'm going to kind of do this. He'll let you do that. And it's not that he doesn't love you. It's that he loves you so much. He gives you free will. And we need to recognize that. But the first choice God made was the best choice. And they didn't. They didn't cross over. And so what happened to them? They begin to mingle with the people of Moab. They begin to hang out with people. They begin to interact with people that weren't God's people. They begin to practice the customs that the people on the other side of the Jordan practice. And they didn't have the protection of their, of their whole nation. So they were out here and they're being attacked by people. And sooner or later, that nation was destroyed. Those two and a half tribes that stayed on that side were destroyed. And their children lost their inheritance. And I tell you today, and this strong word came strongly to me, please seek the Lord when you make a decision. The financial decision is not always your key indicator. You need to know what God is telling you to do and a wholehearted commitment to seeking him and, and asking him through scripture and, and the wisdom of counsel of good Christian men and women around you will help you make a solid decision. He said he will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is stayed on him or his purpose. God will lead you with peace, but do not be trapped by just looking at your natural circumstances and thinking that that's the right way to go. Often you'll be deceived. And I, I won't carry on much more on this, but there's many times that I made a decision and we made a decision for a family that cost us dearly. And by the grace of God, my family is all serving Jesus today. And it cost us, I can tell you, six digits. Lots and lots and lots it cost us. But that wasn't, that wasn't the answer. We walk in the spirit. We don't walk in the flesh. We don't walk just by that. Though there's lots of times God wants to bless you financially too. And that will be part of the decision. You do that. But uh, remember, compromise brings demise, okay? You know, kids are cattle. That's what I put. <laughs> kids are cattle. You know, you decide, right? Okay. Um, no pressure here. No pressure. Okay. So what else did he do? Caleb patiently pursued the promise of God. Now, as I said before, 45 years, I'd have been gone. I'd said, I am not hanging around with these losers. I'm going, I'm taking a clan of people and I'm going in because God said it. And, and, but he said, no, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm holding. I'm waiting for God. I'm waiting for his perfect will for the nation. And they aligned themselves with the mission of God. You know, not just the personal blessing. They align themselves. Our lives have to be aligned with God's mission for the redemption of humanity. God's purpose to bring um, hope to people or healing to people that are hurt or hope to people that have never heard the gospel. If you align your life with that mission, God will bless you. Okay? We learn to seek, you know, we seek the... Um, we don't seek the blessing of God, a very dangerous thing. And I know we've all come to church and many of us have come to Christ when we're in crisis. Am I the only one? Or, wave at me. You know, you come to Christ when you're in crisis, right? Yeah. 
And, and, and that's right. That's what we do. He shows up by his grace. We come in crisis. We say, oh God, I need you to come and heal me or restore my marriage or my finances. God, do it. And then we live our life focused on the blessing, just focused on this next blessing, this hand, next handout from God. We need to recognize the blessing of God comes to us as a byproduct of walking with the Father, walking with the Lord. Seek the giver, not the gift. We focus on him. We focus on walking with him. We focus on aligning our life with his vision for humanity and his vision for our lives. And all these things are byproducts that just come around. All of a sudden you turn around and it's like, oh, there's another blessing. How can I help you? You know, here's another blessing. Oh, what can I do to help you? Focus on that. They recognize that um, he walked patiently with God. He recognized that the, an inheritance was a free gift. It wasn't spoil from winning a war. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't something they had to earn by doing something. Okay, that's religion. Work hard and you'll get... This was an inheritance. This was a blessing that came from God. Remember the lesson we learned from, from the children walking around the walls of Jericho, right? They were told to walk around. They were told not to say a word, not to sing, not to do anything. After the seventh day, they gave a shout. They weren't to pray. They weren't to, you know throw bows and arrows over the wall. They were just supposed to walk. In fact, they weren't even to blow the, the, blow the silver horn, which declared war on Jericho. They blew the ram's horn, which was the, a celebration saying that we have been given this inheritance. This is the year of Jubilee. So we need to recognize that an inheritance is a promise from God. All we have to do is walk in it, but wait patiently because it's coming. Okay? Say, wait patiently. Wait patiently, it's coming, it's coming. He said, in due season in the New Testament, you will, you will reap if you faint not. Don't faint, don't push the promise. Don't, I wanna get it, I wanna get it, I'm waking. And I guarantee you, I have failed this lesson so many times. I just wanna run in and do what God says and wow, look at this and do that. It's like, whew, just relax, Rick, just relax, okay? Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. In due season, you will reap if you faint not. So what was required of Israel to receive this inheritance was for them to walk in obedience and walk in submission with their God. And it's, it sounds quite simple. And uh, some of them did it and some didn't. So what else did he do? He boasted in the Lord. Disciples, boast in the Lord. Okay, how many times did he mention the Lord? In Joshua 14 and in Numbers 14, he, he came out and he said, the Lord said we can do this. The Lord said we would drive out this. The Lord this, the Lord that. He just kept talking about what the Lord said. But the other 12 spies come out and said, oh, the giants are big. The, the, the walls are fortified. You know, uh, yes, the land is a big blessing, but, you know, there's lots of blessing in the land, but, um, you know, we can't possibly do it. Their focus, the 10 people were focused on the circumstances in their life. And Caleb and Joshua's focus was clearly the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord said. The other day we were ordering blinds for the new church and blinds are expensive for churches. I said, wow, man, they're expensive. Well, we were ordering the blinds and away we went and the guy said something. I said, oh, praise the Lord and said something crazy like that, like in my old Pentecostal, yeah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And he kind of looked at me like, oh, this guy's a weirdo, <laughs> you know. I, mean, I was just praising the Lord. I don't know what was going on. I saw something good. I just like that's what came out of me. And then the guy sent me the, uh, the uh, quote for the things. And he gave me a 40% discount on all our blinds. I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, you just have to give God glory. You have to keep God's word in your mouth. You have to keep focusing on the Lord. And it's so easy to get focused on our circumstances, but hang around with people that aren't afraid to talk about Jesus. Okay. And you know, my family didn't disown me. They're still with me to this day. And every one of them is walking with Jesus too. So I thank God for that. So boast in the Lord, boast in the Lord, be driven by mission, not by blessing. I already described that, that, you know, we're not just looking for the next thing God can do for us. Let's look at the next thing we can do for the Lord. And as we look at the next thing we can do for him, the blessings of God just overtake us. They just come because God is good and you cannot outgive God. You can't outserve God. He loves us and he wants to just pour his provision on you as you seek him. 
Okay? Caleb was bold and confident. Here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the, uh, the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country. Give me this mountain, some versions say, that the Lord promised me that day. Caleb believed in exceptional possibilities. Caleb did not give up in his dream. He believed that if anybody's going to be blessed of God, he was going to be blessed of God. If anybody was going to receive the inheritance of God, he was going to receive it. And that sounds arrogant, but I tell you people, we need to know that God wants to bless a people and it's not just us or whatever. He wants to bless people that will give his name glory and will bring his kingdom in a strong way to the world around them. He wants to bless us. Now, again, we're not looking for the blessing, but we can't be just, well, I'm going to just stay humble and poor. That's a, that's a, that was a value of Catholicism that caused their, the whole religious group to stay. You know, one of the highest values was poverty and big families and, and Catholicism. And you look at the development of the country of Canada and, and the president universities were springing up and they were starting businesses, but the highest value of some of the Catholic people, I'm a Catholic background, so I'm not picking on a religious group, but one of the highest values was this poverty and that have a big family and say, you know, you know, this is, this is, this is a, a high value. So they didn't go on and possess everything that God wanted many of them to possess. So don't be this false humility. God wants us to be blessed. Right. Say that God wants us to be blessed. And, and he, but we have to do it in humility and putting him first. Of course, you know that. All right. So Caleb was bold and confident. He said, I know what you promised me. I want it and I want it now. And then the next thing happened and I, I wasn't going to go into this, but his daughter was very blessed too. All of a sudden his daughter raised up and he said, okay, wh whichever one of you men are going to take this mountain, the certain tribe that he was sending them out to battle, he said, whoever brings me victory in that town, I'm going to give you my daughter. And uh, so one guy goes out, fights a ferocious battle, wins this mountain. He said, here's my daughter. Oh, and said, well, what land do you want? And so here's the land he gave them. And his daughter said, I also want this. You've given me this lovely parcel of land, but I also want this. I want the water and I want the streams so we can be abundantly blessed. You know what? Your children will be blessed when you follow the Lord too. And they'll raise up with bold faith too. And they'll raise up and be a blessing to the people around them. So these are some of the, some of the things we can learn from the life of uh, Caleb. It was a... a an amazing life. And to this day, it says that he um, possesses that land and his children and his uh, children that came behind him all still possess that land of Hebron. And so that's a pretty amazing story that you can have good success. You don't have to uh, kind of be half-hearted and all of a sudden all your children fall away from the Lord. You can have good success. Trust God and step into that. Well, where are you today? As we talked about, um, you know, we talked at the beginning that, you know, you might be feeling empty and at the end of yourself. And we talked about maybe you're, maybe you're still exhausted, but you're feeling good because God's doing lots of things around you. But as I spoke, you recognize there's some things underlying that maybe you need to deal with. Maybe you need to give them to the Lord. Maybe you need to invite him to come and bring healing in an area that you're suffered rejection or an area that you find yourself insecure. You just don't have the confidence you used to have. God wants to come and bring healing to that. We know the, the, the songs we sang were about Jesus Christ and how he alone came and he paid the penalty so that we could be restored to fullness with the Father. He paid a price that we couldn't pay. He, he obeyed God where we as a human race disobeyed God. He made it right where we couldn't. And so he's here today, and the Father is here today. Say, come to the altar. Come to me. The altar is just a place of surrender. And say, God, I need you. I recognize during this talk, I'm a little insecure. I recognize that maybe I'm fearful that I'm being passed over, that maybe I'm too old. Or maybe you've identified that, that you know, I've been working too hard, and man, I, I might just keel over here and be a dumb camel. But God says, I want to come to you, and I, I want to restore you completely. I want to heal you mind, body, and spirit. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty so that your spirit can be born again. Scripture says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. He'll light a light in your heart and you'll know that something has changed. He'll 
transform your mind. He'll get you to have not so many sleepless nights, not so many, oh, did I do this wrong? Did I do that wrong? You'll walk in a new confidence, a new peace, because the author of salvation guards your heart and your mind, your soul. And maybe you have a physical ailment today and uh, lots of different times we have different physical ailments. The Lord would love to touch those things too. 1 Peter 2.24 says, uh, by Jesus' stripes, we were healed. Spirit, soul, and body is the healing that's described there. But every area of our body, we can go to the Lord and say, Father, would you touch me? Would you heal me here? Not so I can just have the blessing of healing, but that I can be a better minister of the gospel the good news that you love people and you care for people. This week, Wednesday morning, is a, it was a crazy week for me this week. Last Sunday, um, you know, we had a, a major dream that I had. It kind of went up in flames, literally. And it was a dream of something I thought God was doing. And, and uh, so that dream was kind of dashed that day. It's been restored already. It's a week later. My dream, I'm seeing God, what he's doing and how he's doing it. So it was a really bad day last Sunday night. But Wednesday, we were at our, our business prayer lunch at Earl's, 7.30 to 8.30. It's a breakfast. Uh, man, we were just praying, and we don't preach the gospel every week, trying to lead people to the Lord. But uh, this one man, the Spirit of God just came on him, and he said, I need to get my foundation fixed. My foundation of my life is not right. The man that was sharing, sharing the good news that day was sharing the, the Bible study around business said he was on a job site one time in the Caribbean and, and um, the Caribbean and uh, said that they were doing a new foundation and they had the cement and they had the sand. The sand was actually from the shoreline. It was very clean sand. It was great for a foundation. He said, but then the locals went and got salt water and mixed it with the cement. And salt water and cement doesn't really do. There's a chemical reaction between lime and, and cement and salt and it just didn't work and the foundation crumbled. And as the man shared this story, this other guy in the room just starts to weep, just starts to weep, starts to weep. He's talking. He's talking under his heart, saying, I, I, need, to get my found, I, need, to, I need to get my foundation fixed. My foundation needs to be fixed. It's crumbling. It's not right. That's why the rest of my life isn't in order. And he wept and he wept and he wept. And we prayed together. And this man who'd been in our midst for a long, long time, we didn't really know where he stood with the Lord, but he was there. And this man just said, I want my foundation fixed. And he prayed for God to come in and fix his life, fix his foundation. That might be you here today. You don't know what's wrong, some, but you know something's wrong. The Lord wants to fix your foundation. Maybe there's some elements in your faith life or some elements of the life you've been living that were just a little contaminated with the wrong kind of salt. Maybe there's just one thing God wants to say, hey, I'm just going to help you reconstruct this and you'll live strong and you'll build a strong life with me in the middle of it. If that's you today, I'm going to give you a chance. You might be another person here today that have, um, you know, you recognize you're born again, but you recognize that, uh, you know, you're not walking in the fullness. Maybe you're identified. I'm still on the east side of the Jordan. Well, I'm telling you, God's saying, get out of there. Get this other side of the Jordan really quick before somebody comes and clobbers you. You can do that today too. You can say, God, I recognize I've compromised. I, I confess that now and I ask that you would take me into the inheritance that you've promised for me many years ago. I'm going to count to three. If you want to get your foundation fixed, if the Bible calls it being born again or being saved or being your spirit renewed, just say, I want that. And then I'm going to pray a prayer for the rest that want to just come back into the fullness of wholehearted commitment to Christ. Your life will never be the same as when you wholeheartedly surrender to him. He loves you. He's got something great for you today. We love you too. And that's why sometimes we bring a little harder message, you know, a little harder. We've got to, God, God's got more for us, but it might cost us a little bit. The count of three, just put your hand up. You want to get your foundation fixed or you want to... Uh, Surrender wholeheartedly, God. One, two, three. Put your hand up in this place. Put your hand up online saying, I just need more of God. I need to get this right. God's got a blessing for you. He's got a life walking with him. Yes. Yes. Everybody pray with me. All nations nice and strong. Hey, God, thank you for Jesus. I believe he died to restore my foundation. 
to show me how to live well, to be blessed and be a blessing. I invite him into my life now and I invite you to invigorate me with your Holy Spirit so I can live well and be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we're just about at the end of this series and uh, it's been a great series. Uh, I encourage you to read it through again and look at some of these messages, share with your friends. There's a lot in them, but God really has a desire for us to go to a new level with him. There's idols in our lives that God will, will deal with in a couple of weeks. And, um, and God just wants to take us to a new level so that we can serve people and care for people. Uh, this week, we've got life groups going on. We've got uh, uh, the Freedom Conference coming on the 18th and 19th of November. You're going to want to be at that. Register online right now. But God wants us to come together and serve people and care for people. So I thank God for Christine and the outreach team. They're doing the first uh, skating today, the skating event. It's going to be great. Serving hot chocolate. There'll be a couple of hundred kids there today feeding them. And uh, find a way that you can, you know, maybe maybe spend 50 or 100 bucks or whatever and buy some prizes for kids. And let's fill that table up and let's bless a bunch of Fort McClory families, right? Let's bless them. Let's just be generous. And, and we're not getting the credit. The parents get the credit, you know? Just be generous people. Live generously with your time, with your encouragement, with your finances, and watch what God will do because he loves us so much. Let me bless you. Father, I thank you for your love. I pray you would just infuse us with more of your divine love. I pray that the grace and the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ would be in every part of our life. And I pray, God, we would know the intimacy and the friendship of the Holy Spirit who walks with us, who never leads us, who encourages us and strengthens us for all the work he's called us to do. I bless your people now with this, now and always, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. There is no way. There is no way.